Hello and welcome to another episode of Katie the Science Lady. I'm Mrs. Jacobson and today's topic is passive transport. So let's learn together. Okay, so today's topic is passive transport, and it's really important to understand this in order to understand how cells keep a constant internal environment, also called homeostasis. So that's a really important part of what we're going to be learning today is the fact that your cells want to maintain homeostasis or a stable baseline internal environment. Our cells always want to be equal or have the right amount of water or nutrients or what have you in their cells. They want to make sure that everything is correct and when they are missing something or have too much of something they need to transport it out of the cell or into the cell in order to maintain homeostasis so first we're going to start talking about passive transport passive transport is the movement of molecules across the cell membrane without the use of atp energy no energy is required for this process so this is something that happens naturally it happens pretty easily and we'll have some examples of your everyday life as well in a moment it always moves from high concentration to low concentration. So the way I like to think about this is if somebody sprays um, a perfume or some sort of smelling spray in one corner of a room, it doesn't just stay in that corner of the room. Over the course of 10, 15 minutes, everyone through the whole room will be able to smell it if it's strong enough. Those molecules of that smell, that scent, have been carried through the room and spread out from an area of high concentration where it was first sprayed to the areas of low concentration much further away in the room. So that's a, a pretty easy example from your everyday life. And again, that's what we see here in this picture. We have a high concentration of molecules here, the red molecules. Now we don't know what they are, and it doesn't matter. They can be glucose or um, they could be sodium or potassium, or they could even be water. Uh, but what they're doing is they're going to be moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So the chemical driving force here is just showing you what direction those molecules will be moving from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell from high to low concentration. And again, this is going to require no energy. And we can see it in the second example here. The high concentration is now outside the cell. The low concentration is inside the cell. So those molecules are going to be pulled into the cell. This requires no energy. I know movement is happening um, and that we think that it should be requiring energy because something's going on, but naturally this is what occurs um, and we don't need energy in order to make this happen. So ATP, we don't need it. It's not going to happen with any form of passive transport. So that's important to keep in mind. The first example of passive transport we're gonna talk about today is diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of molecules to reach homeostasis or equilibrium. It's essentially just passive transport, um, but diffusion is a pretty broad category of passive transport that we talk about. Once uh, diffusion has caused molecules to spread out evenly, we can say that equilibrium has been achieved or homeostasis has been achieved because we've gotten back to that everything is normal kind of baseline. And I use the word baseline, um, can, uh, equilibrium is probably the more scientific word, but I like baseline because it reminds me of it has to go back to normal essentially. So we see that when you drop something into, um, into water. So if you take food coloring or some powdered drink mix, something like that, it's going to not just stay clumped up in one place. Eventually it will move through the whole liquid. Um, so those colored molecules from the, the dye are gonna spread out throughout that entire s substance. If it's water or whatever you're using, it's going to spread out until it's evenly distributed or it, it has reached equilibrium and homeostasis. So we can tell that here we've reached that homeostatic phase because it, you don't see kind of globs anymore. It's all nice and spread out. It's all equal. Facilitated diffusion is the second type of passive transport we'll talk about today. This one will confuse a couple of people. Um, so kind of bear with me as we talk about this. It is still diffusion. It is still no ATP energy. It is still going from high to low concentration. But in facilitated diffusion, molecules are going to be moved through the cell membrane by helper proteins. So helper proteins are functioning, but we're not using energy. So it sounds a little strange. 
We have two types of proteins or two main types that are used in facilitated diffusion. The first is a channel protein, which is really just, it sounds exactly like what it is. It's like a tunnel through the cell membrane. And it's going to let, pro, um, let molecules of certain sizes in and out. And the second is called the carrier protein. It may be a little more specific, um, but it performs the exact same function. It's going to let something in on one side, bring it in, and let it out the other side of the membrane. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. So a channel protein looks like this. It is a tunnel, essentially. Things can go in and they can go out, but they're going to always be moving from high concentration to low concentration. So that part hasn't changed. There's still no ATP involved, but the channel protein kind of messes, um, messes with us a little bit on that front. And the second type is a carrier protein. Still no ATP energy being used here. That is the most confusing part for a lot of my students. They think that because something is moving, that something has to be using energy, and that's just not the case here. So remember, no ATP energy is being used, but facilitated diffusion is basically just diffusion with a protein helper, is how I think of it. Here's the main difference. We've got a protein in facilitated diffusion. Here's our channel protein going straight through the middle of the cell membrane. And then facilitated diffusion on this side is being used with a, um, a carrier protein. The third type of passive transport that we'll talk about today is osmosis. Now, if you are older like me, you've probably heard of the movie Osmosis Jones. Um, it was a pretty great movie. Um, it was animated and it had Bill Murray in it, but um, osmosis had nothing to do with the movie really. But it's the diffusion of water through a membrane. So it is diffusion, but it's just specific to water. And you may have also seen this on your water bottle. If you have like a Dasani bottle or any brand of water really, you'll see that it's been purified by reverse osmosis. Um, and it talks about pulling that water through some sort of membrane or filter in order to clean it more. So that's why your water says that. When we talk about osmosis, we have to go over a few kind of definitions or key terms. A solute is a substance dissolved in a liquid. I typically think of the solute as being something found in crystal or powder form, something more like um, salt or sugar um, or glucose, some of those kind of substances, because it's going to be dissolved in a liquid like water. The solvent is that liquid. So whatever's doing the dissolving, whether it's water um, or you may have some other different kind of acids or bases um, in chemistry, but whatever liquid is dissolving that powder, um, that is the solvent. And the solution is the mixture of the two things. So solution, it kind of sounds like that. It sounds like the final ending. It's when you have a mixture of the previous two things. So the tough part is keeping these apart because they all sound very similar. Um, so I, solution I keep on its own because that one I can remember a little bit easier. Um, but solute, I just have to remember that solute sounds the most like salt to me. Solute, salt, um, and salt would be an example of a solute. When we mix these together, you'll find a solution. Um, and this is a pretty good visual of that just to help you kind of see one is a liquid, one is typically a solid of some kind, and then the mixture of the two makes a solution. Again, no ATP energy involved in osmosis. The next thing we're going to go over is how different um, cells react in different environments and how osmosis occurs. This is the part where it can get pretty confusing. So, tonicity. This is describing the concentrations of solute. Um, tonicities are incredibly simple, but they can get confusing um, because it, it almost involves like a math equation. It's not really a math equation, but I like to break it down like that. So hopefully as you follow along, these will make a little bit more sense. We call something hypertonic if the concentration is higher. So hyper means higher. Um, it's like if someone were hyperactive, they would have a higher level of energy. Um, it, hypotonic would be the opposite. It's where the concentration is lower. Um, I remember with the rhyme, hypo is low. Um, but you can also think of hypothermia. You get hypothermia when it's really, really cold and the temperature is really low. So hypo means low. And then isotonic. When both concentrations are equal, they are isotonic. So isotonic is what our cells want to get to. That's that homeostasis we've talked about. That's that nice even keel. So your goal here is isotonic. But a lot of times your cells may be in a hypertonic or a hypotonic environment and have to fix that so that they can get to the isotonic. Again, remember, no ATP energy is being used during any of these processes. 
Um, this is not requiring energy at all. We will talk about when energy is used in a future lesson, and that will be for our active transport. So we have three different types here. Over here, this is our hypotonic. It's hard to see, but that's hypotonic. We have an isotonic solution. You can see they're equally spread out on both sides. There is no higher or lower concentration here. But you can see here, in the hypertonic solution, we have a much higher concentration of these bluish green dots on the outside of the cell compared to the inside of the cell where it's a much lower concentration. Okay, let's do a real world example. If we think about your blood and you've ever been to a doctor or an ER or one of those 24 hour care places, um, you may have either had an IV yourself or seen an IV. And for sure you've seen one on TV in a medical show of some kind. But an IV consists of liquids and some, um, some molecules in there, some salts, some sugars, that help to balance um, your bloodstream. And there's a reason why you can't just put water into your bloodstream. And we're gonna talk about that right now. So I want you to take a look at the middle section really quickly. This is our isotonic cell. Water is going into the cell and water is going out of the cell, meaning it's equal. So it's not having to pull a lot of water in, it's not having to get rid of a lot of water, it's, it's your happy cell, for lack of a better term. When your cells are in an isotonic condition, everything's good. Everything's working the way it should be. You're not dehydrated, you're not overly hydrated, you are just right. And it has the right balance of things inside. Now, if you, let's say, forget to drink water for a whole day, and you're constantly thirsty and you feel dehydrated, what will happen is because your red blood cells start out having a nice amount of water, or a good amount of water, a high concentration, but then your bloodstream and your body is dehydrated or doesn't have enough water, the water in your blood cells is going to move because it wants to balance everything even if that's negative towards the cells. So if you do not have a lot of water in your bloodstream because you're dehydrated, your blood cells will actually give up water to try and make things even, which as we can tell is not good for your blood cells. So that's one bad situation. You don't want to be dehydrated because your cells are going to start giving up water that they need. On the flip side, if you are in a hypotonic kind of concentration situation in your blood and you've got, let's say a lot or a really high concentration of water in your bloodstream, like for some reason, if you had injected water into your bloodstream, now your cells are, they have less, um, they have the low concentration of water. So you have a high concentration outside the cells and a low concentration of water inside your cells that water is going to rush into your cells and eventually your cells will burst. Cells don't keep getting bigger and bigger as they fill with water, they will pop. Um, so you can actually really make yourself sick by either drinking too much water, you have to drink gallons for this to happen, but drinking too much water or injecting yourself with water is very dangerous because your blood cells will explode, essentially. Again, I like the word explode, it sounds more fun to me. So again, here, we have a normal blood cell in the middle, it's isotonic. Here we have kind of a shrunken blood cell, um, and that's in a dehydrated person. And then over here, we know this blood cell doesn't look good. And it's because that blood cell has lysed or burst. Um, and that was because there was too much water surrounding it. So if you put red blood cells in just a little dish with pure water, they will burst. Um, they do not do well in that environment because they need salts and sugars to balance everything out. We're going to go through a couple of sample problems here. What you could do if you want to work through these yourself is pause me as I introduce it um, and then try and work out the entire solution yourself and then listen for the answers as we go. When I do these kinds of questions, in my head it helps me to think of where is it a high concentration and where is it a low concentration. So over here if we look at the outside of the cell, we have a high concentration of water, 85% is high, and a 15% concentration of solute, that's pretty low. Inside our cell, we have a 5% concentration of solute and a 95% concentration of water. So now even though 85 seemed high out here, it is higher in the cell. So we can label this as having a high concentration of water and a low concentration of solute. So if we wanna figure out where everything moves, and this particularly the water, it moves from high to low. So if you put a big H here on your cell for high and an L here for low concentration of water, 
the water will move out of the cell. And that's because it is a high concentration inside the cell and a low concentration outside the cell. It's passive transport, so it's always going to move from high concentration to low concentration. I kind of think of it like being on a slide. If you're sitting on top of a slide, it doesn't take a lot of energy to go down that slide from high to low. And that's like passive transport. Doesn't require energy, pretty easy, um, nothing crazy going on. Let's try another example. We have a cell in a hypotonic solution. So now we look to see where, again, we're looking at where is the water going to move. So we look at our concentrations of water here. Outside the cell, we have a high concentration of water, 80%, compared to inside the cell, where it's 70%. Even though there's not that much of a difference, inside the cell, it's still a lower concentration. So we still have to kind of label this with an L and label the outside with an H for the high concentration. Because water will move from high to low concentration, it is going to move into the cell. So where we have that 80, you can almost just draw an arrow connecting the 80 from the high to the low, and it will show you the pathway that the water moves. One final example. We have a cell in an isotonic solution. Now most of you are sitting there saying, um, Ms. Jacobson, didn't you just say that it's equal? I did. But remember, once it's equal, we have 90% water outside and 90% water inside, it doesn't mean that nothing will happen. We always constantly have motion in our bodies and our cells and our tissues. So instead of not going anywhere, water will in, in fact go both directions. So water will go in and out of the cell because that movement is constant. But because it's isotonic or equal already and we're at homeostasis, it will just keep going back and forth in a nice even manner. Let's recap what we've learned today. So before we talk about passive transport, we have to first describe homeostasis. And homeostasis is the state of a cell where it tries to keep a stable internal environment. In other words, a cell just wants everything to be normal or at a nice even baseline at all times. When we get out of whack, our cell has to kind of pull us back to that center point um, where it wants to operate. Now passive transport is going to help us keep homeostasis in our cells but it requires no ATP energy, and it always has molecules move from where they have a high concentration or where there are more of that molecule to low concentration or where there is less of that type of molecule because they're going to spread out. There are several types of passive transport that we talked about today. We talked about diffusion, which is really just the simple movement of molecules from high to low concentration. We also talked about osmosis, which is the movement of water molecules from high to low concentration. It's the same as diffusion, but specifically with water molecules. And we finally talked about facilitated diffusion, which is very similar to diffusion, but it's occurring specifically across the cell membrane and uses a protein. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe for more biology videos. And until next time, I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something and I'll see you later.